but I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you tonight. I feel incredibly blessed to be able to do something that I love for people that I respect and admire who have entrusted their capital to our care at Stacy Muirhead. I've got a wonderful family which supports me unconditionally. I get to work at the office every day with very talented associates and a wonderful business partner, Bill, who you were just introduced to a minute ago. Uh, Bill is smart, hardworking, and he has a moral compass that's pointed due north at all points in time. One of the other reasons I wanted to come tonight and, and speak to you, since my earliest days as an investor, I've been fortunate to get to know many successful investors in the field. And they helped me, they mentored me, um, including several who have spoken here at the center on uh, past occasions. So I feel a tremendous obligation to the craft of investing. And I'm happy to share my experiences and, and offer any wisdom that I may have accumulated over the years in the same generous spirit that others uh, shared uh, their experiences and, and wisdom with me. I did. I, I hope you'll permit me just to make a few quick comments about the Ben Graham Center for Value Investing here at the Ivy School of Investment, or Ivy School of Business. Excuse me. I, I think that what your professor George Athanasakis has worked so hard to develop here is a really a tremendous opportunity for you as students. Your course material is useful. It's grounded in real-world value investing principles. I've read both The Intelligent Investor and Value Investing from Graham to Buffett uh, and beyond. I understand those are two of the textbooks you're, you're, you're using in your courses. And, and I want to assure you that from a practitioner's viewpoint, they are truly excellent textbooks. And then to be able to supplement all that with speakers and, and the excellent speakers that you've had come here to the center over the last uh, five years, in my mind it's created a wonderful foundation for those of you who may choose to pursue a career in the investment profession. So George, I offer to you my congratulations for all that you've done to create such an enriching environment for your students. As I look through the list of speakers that you have coming this term, I can tell you I feel a little bit like the warm-up act for the Rolling Stones. I see that you're going to be visiting Warren Buffett in a couple of weeks in Omaha. I attended my 20th Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting last year, my 20th consecutive Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting last year. And, and I've learned much that is of enormous value from the wisdom and experience of Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. And as you'll see in a few minutes uh, when I describe what we do at Stacy Muirhead, much of it's a direct result of the valuable lessons we've learned from, from Warren and Charlie. Later in the term, I, I see that David Winters is coming, Prem Watts uh, will be speaking to your class, and Bob Tattersall. All three of those individuals are friends of mine, and I can assure you that they are outstanding investors and even better people. So I just want to encourage you to take advantage of the wonderful learning opportunity that, that Professor Athanasakis has uh, created for you here at Ivy. But what I thought I'd like to do tonight is, is try to make an effort to explain our investment philosophy, what we utilize day to day at Stacy Muirhead, and then to illustrate how we put that philosophy into practice uh, with some specific examples of current investments that we have. Um, for those of you here in the room, obviously we've got the PowerPoint presentation of the talking points that I'm going to be presenting. I know that this is uh, ultimately being webcast and I've seen a few of the past ones. I do listen to the other speakers that come here and, and I know that it, it tends not to show up very well on the webcast. So unfortunately for those of you that are going to be watching on webcast, you will not likely be able to see the slides very clearly. So with that as, as, as my introductory comments, why don't I start with just a quick commercial about Stacy Muirhead and, and who we are so that it, it puts into perspective for you what, what we do. 
Firms independently owned and operated, uh, Bill and I are the two uh, shareholders in the firm. Collectively, we have 32 years of investment experience. We started uh, the, the, the original partnership, the Stacy Muirhead LP, was started in 1994, and the Stacy Muirhead RSP fund uh, started 10 years later in 2004. I think the overriding thing about what we do at Stacy Muirhead is that we are investment driven. And, and, and focused and, and not marketing driven. Everything we do organizationally is about creating the ideal investment environment. We've got a simple structure, only two funds. We also manage a one separate account, um, but we don't have reams of different accounts with different uh, constraints. There's no constraints in how we invest the, the capital at, at either the RSP fund or the LP. Uh, Bill and I have all our personal capital invested in our two funds on exactly the same basis as all our, our unit holders. And we have a compensation structure that's pay for performance oriented. So we give you just a quick snapshot of our track record with our original fund uh, that started January 1st, 94. The stat is up to the end of January, so 16 years and one month. Um, we have achieved an annual compounded rate of return after all fees of 8.6%. And that compares to the Toronto or Canadian benchmark, market benchmark of 8.2% compounded. And the S&P 500, the primary U.S. market benchmark at 5.9%. So we're very proud that we've been able to outperform uh, the market benchmarks. As I'm sure you're learning in your class here, uh, most money managers fail to outperform their market benchmarks over long measurement periods. Certainly, we haven't outperformed the benchmark every year. We don't hold that out as any objective, but over the long term, we're, we, we certainly think that um, that's a way that you should, should measure us. And then just looking at the same thing a different way, the traditional, if you'd put uh, 150,000 with us at the beginning in the partnership. As of the end of January, we would have written you a check for $563,000 um, if you chose to leave the partnership. You see there the comparatives to the two primary market benchmarks at 535,800 and 378,000 for the U.S. benchmark. And, to me, this chart shows the miracle of compounding. I know you probably talk about this in your classes, um, but it's just amazing to me how modest differences in annual returns can lead to significant amounts of material monetary difference over long periods of time in an investor's pocket. So if you remember the slide before, we're at 8.6 versus 5.9 for the U.S. market. doesn't seem like that much of a difference when you say it that way, but it's uh, um, almost uh, $200,000 uh, cumulatively on an initial $150,000 uh, invested. So that's a um, quick commercial on, on who we are and hope that maybe puts uh, into perspective what we are about. Um, guiding tenants. There are two documents that guide everything that we do at our firm on a daily basis, our investment philosophy and governing principles, and we've circulated uh, copies of both those documents to you. If we ran short on copies, I can certainly arrange to get more uh, um, at a later date for you. Just speak to uh, Professor Athanasakis and we, we can take care of that for you. Um, both documents are published in our annual report to our unit holders each year and are available on our website. Let's start from the beginning. What are we trying to do as investment managers for the people that have committed their capital to, to our care? To me, it comes down to two main things. We're trying to maximize the average annual return on capital. You notice I put after tax and italics in our limited partnership. We think a lot about taxes in the RSP fund because it, that's dealing with pension and RSP capital. Taxes isn't, isn't an issue per se. But it has to be more than just maximizing return. 
We're also trying to minimize, at the same time, minimize the risk of permanent impairment of capital. The phrase uh, that I like to use is we want our unit holders to both eat well and sleep well. Yes, we have the same amount of investment testosterone as anybody else and we want to hit home runs, but it's also important that we don't strike out for our clients. And so we try to keep those two things in mind at all points in time. And then how do you measure that? Well, I would argue that a money manager's job is to outperform the market over the long term. And as I showed you a minute ago, we've been pleased that we've been able to do that. We're not cocky. This is a business that will make you humble in a hurry. Um, every day is a new day, but uh, we think we have a framework that works over the long run. So let's talk about principles. And so all the way through here, I'm, I'm continuing to, to drill down and, and get a little more granularity um, in, in terms of, of what we do. First three won't surprise you. Classic Benjamin Graham. Think about stocks as, a part, as part ownership of a business. Maintain the proper emotional attitude. That's uh, Ben's famous Mr. Market uh, example that I'm sure you've heard, of, heard about in your classes already and then insist on a margin of safety. Those first three principles, by the way, I've been on the, uh, on the website for the Ben Graham Value Center uh, here. That's uh, right in the mission statement for the Value Center. We're no different, but these are very, very important principles. They've guided us. Um, they've been the successful principles for investing since Ben Graham articulated them in the 30s, and they are likely to be bedrock investment principles a hundred years from today. So first three, I think, well known to you. The last two, do not diversify excessively and invest for the long term, I think is more the Warren Buffett uh, uh, approach. And uh, um, as I mentioned in my introduction, we've been enormously influenced by the Buffett example and, and try to uh, utilize uh, the principles that, that he's so effectively used at Berkshire Hathaway for, for 40, 50 years now. Do not diversify excessively. To me, it's pretty simple. How can your hundredth best idea possibly be as good as your third best idea? That just, it, it, it's just simple logic to me. The other part about diversifying is that the amount of time to keep on top of a widely diversified portfolio, it seems to me that it's, it, it borders on virtual impossibility to really know something. You have to spend time with it and, and study it. And so I, I just don't see how you can do that with 100 stocks in your portfolio. A couple of quotes uh, from Buffett that, that, that I hope articulate this and, and give you some sense for it. Buffett says, diversification is protection against ignorance. But if you're not ignorant, the need for it goes down dramatically. And he also says that concentrated portfolios may in fact reduce risk, overall risk, if it increases the intensity with which you think about the investments that you're contemplating making. And so that's the mindset that, that we bring to it. And although we don't strictly define we're only going to have X number of investments, it is definitely fair to state that we run very concentrated portfolios relative to industry norms and loosely defined, I think, 10 to 20 securities is sort of how we view the investment world. Invest for the long term, of course, that's one of those um, motherhood statements that often get made to me, what does that mean? Guessing short-term price movements in individual stocks or in the overall market, um, I'm not going to say no one can do it, but certainly we can't do it at Stacy Muirhead, so we don't even try. The other part about it to me is that for taxable investors, every time you buy and sell something, you're taxable on that transaction. So if you can make one good investment and hold it for a long, long period of time, the mathematics of that compounding equation work out much more in your favor because you're keeping the tax man out of it as your partner. And incidentally, down the road when you eventually sell, 
the tax uh, department in Ottawa benefits in exactly the same ratio you do, they just have to wait a little while to get their money. So we think it's really important to invest for the long term. So what do we do with the capital? We think about our business having four buckets of activity. And the fourth one, quite frankly, is the least important and, and really is just a default position. So first three, long-term investment holdings, arbitrage and workout situations, high yield and distress positions, and fixed income instruments. And, and I'm going to take you through now and we're going to take each one of those areas. We're going to talk about the principles that we utilize and then I'm going to give you an example for each area of a current investment that we, that we have and uh, take you through our thought process and, and how we got there. So long-term investment holdings. We think it comes down to answering four questions. First one, can we understand it? And oftentimes that doesn't figure into investors' thinking. I think it's critically important to be successful, you have to stay within your circle of competence. And I'm not saying that a, an investment that we're, that's not within our circle of competence, it may be a perfectly excellent investment for somebody else uh, who understands it better than we do. But if we don't understand what we own or what we're contemplating buying, we don't do it. It's that simple. Does it possess favorable business economics? So we're looking for businesses that have strategic competitive advantages or a sustainable competitive advantage. What are the characteristics of those types of businesses? High returns on equity, strong balance sheets with minimal debt, uh, attractive operating and, and net profit margins, uh, usually a dominant position in their industry. Uh, there may be brand, uh, some sort of brand recognition uh, associated with the products that that company sells. Pricing power, do they have pricing power to increase the price of their products or are they a price taker? Um, certainly growing revenues and, and, and earnings over long periods of time. Not every year, because no business is a straight line up. Um, but over time, we want to see growing revenues and earnings and sustainable free cash flow generation. A business is only worth what you can take out of it in cash over the long term. Does it have honest and capable management? We think this is another critical component to making successful long-term investments. I think it boils down to three things. We want to align ourselves with honest and principled managers who think and act like owners. Best way to have someone think and act like an owner is have them be an owner. So we look for management teams that have committed significant portions of their own personal net worth to the business on the same basis that we're contemplating making an investment. Compensation practices uh, enter into this. We're all for pay for performance. Um, as long as there is a realistic bogey for per performance. Um, all too often we see uh, management teams that get uh, loads and buckets of options and large bonuses where they really haven't cre created any demonstrable value for shareholders. So we want reasonable compensation practices. And then the other thing we really look for is effective capital allocation. Oftentimes managers are empire builders and they're really more concerned with expanding than, ultimate, uh, uh, than deploying capital in an effective and efficient way. So we really look for that as well. And then can it be purchased at an attractive price? Even the world's greatest company is a lousy investment if you pay too much for it. So we, we, we really try and, and, and take a look at the price we're willing to pay for something so that we can set up a rate of return that's attractive for our unit holders. And there's no magic to this. I think that using the discounted cash flow model uh, and approach to valuing companies makes a lot of sense. Um, and intuitively, that's what we do. But 
I would be lying to you if I said we model it out precisely because I think that um, although it's intuitively the right way to think, it's very hard to do to plot cash flows out year by year with accuracy into the future. And so we have to engage in a bit of a shorthand to get there. And we use all the same um, tools as everybody else, price to earnings, price to free cash flow, uh, dividend yields, um, price to book value measures. We look at the earnings yield relative to, to risk-free investments at any point in time like long-term government treasury bonds or the very highest quality corporate bonds to, to make our assessments of whether we're purchasing at an attractive price or not. So what we're looking for is a, an excellent business with wonderful economic characteristics uh, run by wonderful people that's available at an attractive price. And I know a number of years ago Mason Hawkins spoke to the school and, and I'm shamelessly stealing from their approach here, but the way we think about it, great business, great people, great price. It's, it's, it's really that simple. So let's talk about an example and try and take you through our rationale. Indigo Books and Music, uh, perhaps you've been in their stores uh, so they have uh, a number of uh, retail concepts, so Indigo, Chapters, Smith's, Cole's Books uh, being the biggest, the world's biggest bookstore in Toronto is another uh, branded name that, that they use at one location. Let's talk that through a little bit. So they're the largest book retailer in Canada through physical sites. In fact, uh, they are far and away the largest and have almost a quasi-monopoly. They're an online retailer uh, through chaptersindigo.ca. Um, certainly not the presence that Amazon has, but they've done very well with their website as well, and, it, and it's, it's profitable. New on the scene is e-reading, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But they have an e-reading entrant, uh, kobobooks.com. Um, which we are very excited about and we think represents potentially a brand new growth engine for Indigo. And then they also have a new retail concept, Pistachio, that they're testing in two locations only. And it, they sell eco-friendly products through those locations. They also sell Pistachio products through their superstores, their chapters and Indigo stores. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Pistachio in a moment because I think it it really demonstrates management's uh, discipline um, because things haven't gone as well as they had hoped for initially uh, with pistachio and, and so that's um, it's interesting it, it really demonstrates that effective capital allocation that I was talking about earlier um, in terms of achievement recognition they are uh, have been recognized as the number one national retailer in Canada on a couple of uh, occasions as having the best retail concept and best retail store design so just a little bit of background on how much uh, uh, we own the current market capitalization of, of uh, indigo books and music as of the end of January is about 397 million current stock price is sixteen dollars and nineteen cents our average cost, 1227 We own 239,000 shares between our two funds. We first purchased shares in March 2008 and have continued purchases on and off as price opportunities presented themselves and we had available capital uh, throughout uh, 2008 and 2009. Uh, thus far, I've not purchased anything in, in 2010. So let's go back and look at those four questions. Um, we can dispense with the first one pretty quickly. Can we understand it? Yes, I think I'm capable of understanding bookstores and walking in. You know, they buy books from publishers and, and sell them to consumers. Um, it's not some wild technology that I that I'm not capable of appraising. So, you know, can Bill and I understand it? Absolutely. Does it possess favorable eco business economics? Does it have that sustainable competitive advantage? We think yes. Dominant position, far and away the largest retailer uh, through the BRICS part of retailing um, in Canada. In fact, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, we think they have a quasi-monopoly. High returns on equity. This is a company that's consistently generating 
returns on equity above 25% X the excess cash that they have on their balance sheet. Have a strong balance sheet, about uh, 125 million, no debt, and about 125 million, give or take, excess cash on their balance sheet. And they generate consistent, strong, free cash flow. Just about every year, they bring down more in free cash flow than they show in net income. So we, you know, they've grown revenues and earnings over time uh, from, you know, roughly 600 million when Chapters and Indigo came together to probably north of a billion this year. So we think it meets those tests that I talked about a moment ago. Does it have honest and capable management? So remember we talked about what are the three things we look at? Ownership levels, compensation practices, and whether management has demonstrated effective capital allocation over time. So first one, the CEO uh, and her husband, Heather Reisman and, and, and Gerald Schwartz own over 70% of the shares outstanding. Clearly, they have their money up. Compensation. Uh, very reasonable. Heather Reisman takes no options or bonus. This is uh, very unusual. Uh, you won't find that a lot, but we think it's wonderful. Um, but she's aligning her interests with ours. She wants to do well through the share, the 70% share ownership that, that she and her husband have. Capital allocation. Let me just give you some snapshots. When Chapters and Indigo came together, there was over $100 million in debt on the balance sheet. Um, they now have over, they're debt free and have over $125 million, give or take, in excess uh, cash on hand today. So the debt's been totally paid down. They inst instituted a quarterly dividend of 40 cents, uh, or sorry, at 10 cents quarterly, 40 cents annually, uh, about uh, a year ago. Um, based on our cost, that was a, a yield of about three, three and a quarter percent at the time. Um, they have an active share repurchase program. In their fiscal year 2009, they repurchased about 356,000 shares. And in their fiscal year 2010, um, they've repurchased about 35,000 shares. So active share repurchase program. Talked a moment ago about pistachio. So here was a company Indigo that had 120 has had has 125 million dollars in in free cash. They think they have this new idea, pistachio. Eco-friendly products, uh, certainly trying to capture what's a growing trend. Uh, people want to be good uh, environmental stewards. Seemed like a great idea. With $125 million in cash on the balance sheet, I suggest to you that Indigo could have gone up and gone out and whacked up 100 stores across Canada and into the United States very quickly if they wanted to. But no, there's only two stores in test right now. Um, they did actually plan on, on starting another, uh, I think, five uh, additional stores over time. The concept hasn't worked out as well as they thought. It's a little unclear at this point whether they're just uh, the victims of a bad economy or whether the concept really doesn't work. But I would just argue that the way they approached pistachio showed incredible management discipline. And so from an investor's point of view, we, we like that. They, they have the two stores. They're continuing to tinker with the two stores and try and develop that concept. Um, they are selling the products in their, their chapters in Indigo Superstores. They're also selling the products on a selected basis uh, um, on a distribution arrangement with Barnes & Noble uh, down in the States. But the key point from my chair was just that they didn't go out and, and whack up uh, 100 of the 50 of these stores or 100 of these stores before they had a chance to prove up the concept. And so... We think management passes all the tests that we look for with flying colors. And then can it be purchased at an attractive price? Um, let me just take you through some of the very simplistic math here. Current share price at the end of January, uh, $16.19. Excess cash on hand of about $5 a share. So that's a net share price of 11 dollars 
um, trailing 12-month price earnings ratio, just to give you a very simplistic measure, 11.1 times or 7.7 times x the cash. Uh, we think that's attractive for a company that's growing its revenues and earnings, that has high returns on capital. Um, so, and by the way, you know, as as mentioned, we bought it at a price, uh, an average cost of twelve twenty-seven, but we still think it's attractive at at sixteen dollars and nineteen cents. So, that's an example of of a company that we like, um, that we think meets our four tests. I mentioned earlier about e-reading and the development of e-reading and Indigo has a, 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 an entrant in that field called Kobo Books. So let me just talk about that for a moment because uh, we think Kobo could be um, a new growth engine for Indigo but importantly you're not paying for that in the valuation today and so we we're not specking on something that's inherently difficult to forecast. It's, it's, nobody really knows how e-reading's going to unfold over the next uh, several years. But, okay, what is it? It's an e-reading joint venture between Indigo, Borders, the second largest uh, book retail chain in the United States, Red Group Retail, the largest book retailer in Australia and New Zealand, and Chung Kong Holdings, um, run by a very famous entrepreneur named Lee Kai Shing. So they have a global footprint here. Um, I think they would like to add a European partner over time, but they have a very good footprint here in terms of taking this e-reading service worldwide. Indigo has a 58% interest in this joint venture. And there's been a lot of talk. Um, I don't know how much you follow what Amazon is doing with Kindle. Uh, but Kindle is a proprietary system that Amazon has developed and you must order the books uh, to, to go on the e-reading device Kindle through Amazon. Indigo's taken a totally different approach than Kindle and Amazon with their KoboBooks.com. They have totally open publishing standards. Their view is that they want to provide ebooks on any device that anybody chooses to read um, a book in, in e format. So they have application standards available for smartphones like Blackberries and iPhones, uh, for netbooks, for laptops, for desktops, and for the other e reading devices other than the Kindle. So the Sony e-reader and there's a number of, of new ones that, that have uh, recently come to market or are soon to come to market. Breadth of content. They already are the largest content provider of e-books worldwide. They have over two million e-books available for download through their relationships with publishers and already in a short period of time uh, they have d uh, downloaded over one million ebooks in to users in over 200 countries so nobody can tell we don't know how this is all going to unfold uh, we'd like to think that Indigo has a very intelligent approach to this but I, I honestly think it's too too early to declare who the winners are going to be but let me just give you a sense of the math here. So I'm using only the U.S. market. And remember, Kobo's a global, uh, or, or hopes to be a global e-reading enterprise over time. But in the U.S. market, if over time e-books came to represent 10% of the U.S. market, and Borders got the same share in ebooks as they currently have in hard copy books. And those books were sold at more or less the same uh, gross and net profit margins. Over time, uh, we think that, that the way the math would work out, that could be over $9 a share per Indigo share if you put the same valuation on e-reading that is currently be apl being applied to Indigo as a security. 
And remember, we think Indigo's cheap, so I would argue over time, you know, you might find that it could be more than $9 a share. But that's just a sense of the math. So I'm, I'm not saying that's how it's going to turn out. Again, nobody really knows how it's going to turn out, uh, certainly not us. But we're not paying for that in the valuation of Indigo today. And so we think, uh, think of it as a free warrant on the future. And, and certainly we do think that they have a very interesting uh, product entry in the e-reading field. So that's Indigo. So that's an example of a long-term investment holding and we will continue to own those shares and possibly add to to our position as long as we believe that the economics are intact and management is doing the right thing and the price remains uh, attractive. So summary, great business, great people, great price. Uh, the very things that we look for. So let's talk about that second bucket, arbitrage and workout situations. What is it? What is arbitrage? Pursuit of profits from announced corporate events. So that's anything from a merger, a tender offer, a spin-off, a liquidation, um, a bankruptcy reorganization, um, anything where we can evaluate the probability of that event happening, uh, the time that our money's going to be locked up, uh, the opportunity cost um, to us and, and the potential downside. And we like arbitrage as an investment activity because results depend more on corporate activity than overall market behavior. And so what I mean by that is the key driver to your return is will this event happen? And it has nothing to do with whether the overall stock market is up or down 500 or 1,000 points. So let's try and drill down a little bit further. Uh, mentioned briefly in the prior uh, slide the way we evaluate, evaluate arbitrage and workout situations. Again, you're trying to answer four key questions. How likely is it that this promised event will indeed occur? And I want to emphasize something here. Arbitrage often gets um, talked about in the media as if people are uh, betting on takeovers to come and somehow speculating on, on, on whether there will be a takeover. I just want to be clear that we are dealing with announced corporate events. I'm just reading it in the newspaper like everybody else. When Bill and I evaluate an arbitrage situation, it is already out there in the public domain. There's no attempt to try and guess what's going to happen uh, in the future. How long will our capital be tied up? Arbitrage typically, uh, you get very small returns, 3 4%, but your money's not tied up a long time. So on an annualized basis, you can do very well. What chances are there that something still better will transpire? Will some other bidder for the company emerge would be an example of that. Uh, what will happen if the event doesn't take place? What's your downside? So examples there would be what if the potential acquirer can't get financing or what if there's uh, antitrust issues uh, with the takeover? So those are the questions that we're trying to answer. So I'm going to run you through, in the case of arbitrage, actually two examples because I want to take you through one that, we've, that was done in the last year that went through to completion and I'll also take you through one that's currently an open transaction so that you get a sense of, of how these work. So first one is one that happened. Uh, Tusk Energy Corporation. Uh, there was an offer back in February of 2009 for $2.15 per share in cash uh, by way of a plan of arrangement from Polar Star Canadian Oil and Gas. At that time, uh, the information that we were analyzing, we expected an information circular to be mailed in late February. We expected there to be a shareholder meeting to vote on the deal in late March. Um, under a plan of arrangement in Canada, you require uh, two-thirds shareholder approval uh, for a transaction to go through. And because Polar Star uh, was a foreign entity. It this uh, the other main approval that was required in this transaction was Investment Canada Act approval. So, let me take you through how did how did Bill and I evaluate the deal? What were the key issues? Well, the price that was offered represented a hundred and fifty percent premium to where it was trading. So we thought, in all likelihood, shareholders would would approve the deal. Uh, Polar Star. Uh, 
is a wholly owned subsidiary of uh, TIAA CREF, which is one of the largest uh, pension plans in the United States of America, servicing uh, university uh, professors and healthcare uh, professionals. Um, so we, we just thought it was a very good buyer. And in fact, uh, as part of the deal, there were no financing conditions. In other words, Polar Star was agreeing that they had the money and they would put the money up and there was no provision in the documents that, you know, if they couldn't raise the money, um, it, it, it wouldn't go forward. There was a lockup agreement uh, from the management and directors representing 7.7% .7 of the outstanding shares, meaning that they had agreed to tender their shares uh, to Polar Star as part of the deal. You had fairness opinions from two investment banking firms, in this case Macquarie and Scotia Waterus. Um, there was unanimous board approval for the deal at the time the deal was announced. So that's just a snapshot of some of the things that you're trying to think about when you're trying to assess the probability of whether you want to go ahead with an arbitrage deal. Let me take you through the math. So this was the expected return analysis at the time we purchased, and then I'm going to show you how it turned out. So the consideration to be received was $2.15 per share. Um, we were proposing to buy our shares at $2.09. We were going to have to pay a penny and a half uh, a share in commission for a total cost per share of two ten and a half, meaning that our gross profit if this event did indeed occur, was a very slim uh, four and a half cents representing 2.14%. Um, so not a big margin here. But this is the offset. We expected the deal to close within 49 days from the day we purchased it, which uh, you can see there I just noted was, was February 13th, um, a few days after the deal was announced. Um, we expected the deal to close by April 3rd. Um, remember, there was a shareholder meeting scheduled for late March. Um, so 2.14% over 49 days represents an annualized rate of return of 15.92%. So that's what we were thinking, and we did this transaction. And we'll show you how it turned out here. We purchased uh, 500,000 shares on February 13th. The closing date, as it turned out, was actually April 14th, uh, not April 3rd, as we initially uh, projected. So it was 60 days, not 49 days. Um, the gross profit was still 2.14%. Um, we had total invested capital in this arbitrage transaction, a little over a million dollars. Um, but you'll remember when we had a 49-day spread uh, or expected closing period, our return was going to be close to 16%. It ended up dropping to 13% because of that extra time till the deal closed. And this is very typical of, of arbitrage transactions. Sometimes the money takes a little longer. Um, but, you know, we're doing our best to try and evaluate those and build in enough of a margin of safety uh, that if the time uh, ends up, being a little longer than we expect, it's still a reasonable rate of return, and so the 13% annualized rate of return. So that's one that was done. Let me take you to one that's now um, part way through, and so I'll leave, you'll have to look and see how this ends up working out for us. But IMS Health, Inc. Uh, current offer on the table, $22 per share it was w in cash. It was uh, made on November 5th. Uh, last year, the buyers are uh, TPG Capital, uh, Texas Pacific Group, and the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board. Um, there are both U.S. and European antitrust uh, approvals required. I can tell you um, subsequently that the European uh, approvals have already happened. Of course, at the time, the shareholder meeting was expected for February 8th. It did happen on Monday. The, the deal was approved by shareholders. Um, of course, at the time the transaction was announced, uh, you had an unanimous board approval. So again, let's talk through what were the things we were thinking about or, or went into our thought process as we were trying to assess the probability of this deal going through and whether it, it made sense uh, for us to uh, participate. 
Well, first thing I'll say, private equity deals are always riskier than industry buyers. Um, they're doing it strictly for financial reasons, and so they tend to build in more due diligence provisions and uh, um, more of what, what we call at our shop the squeaky or the, the standard weasel clauses that you can get out of a deal. Um, in this case, uh, uh, debt and equity financing fully committed. Obviously, TPG and CPP are going to put up the equity portion. Goldman Sachs had agreed definitively to finance the debt portion of this transaction. Of course, the backdrop of all this um, that, that we really tried to spend some time thinking about is you have a very volatile healthcare regulatory environment in the United States right now, and um, everybody. Um, you have had numerous passes at, at, at new health care uh, plans in the United States. Nobody's really sure how that's going to work out. A uh, key driver in our decision to go ahead was that there was a unique material adverse condition clause in the, in the details to this transaction. Every deal has what's called a MAC clause. So what are the, the material conditions that it could affect the company in question that would allow the buyer to walk from the transaction? In this case, they had a rather unique MAC clause. And in layman's terms, it basically said that no matter what happened to health care in the United States, no matter what new legislation came forward, that was not a material adverse condition that the buyers, the potential buyers, could invoke to walk from the deal. So if there was new health care and it was uh, very unfavorable to IMS health, um, too bad. That was not a reason that, that the buyers could walk unless it disproportionately influenced IMS health versus their competitors. So that's not something you usually see, and that was a critical uh, um, component to our decision. Um, the antitrust approvals in our mind seemed routine, and you currently have EU approval is in place. We also thought shareholder approval seemed likely. So those were the issues we were thinking about. Again, let me take you through the math. And of course, this is not a completed transaction, so we'll have to see how it turns out. But we're going to receive $22 a share in cash. Um, we purchased our shares on January 5th. Uh, we paid uh, just under $21.05 a share with a commission of two cents. So our cost all in $21.06, leaving us almost a $0.94 cent per share profit, representing 4.45% um, in this case, we judge that this transaction will close by the end of March. Don't know. We'll see. But that's our best uh, um, assessment, that it will, in fact, close by the end of March. That's what, what the parties to this transaction are targeting as their closing date. If it does close but on March 31st, that will rep represent an annualized return to us of 19.1%. So we'll see. Um, but wanted to give you an example of something that's, that's live right now. Um, so those are two arbitrage transactions. Let's talk about high yield and distress positions. We view, there's really two parts to this, high yield and distressed, and we, we, we lump them together because we think they uh, um, have similarities. But let's deal with high yield first. So this is securities that we believe can, are currently meeting their interest or dividend obligations that we believe can continue to meet their interest or dividend obligations. But because of perceived uh, or actual difficulties with the company or overall market weakness, you have a very attractive yield on those securities in question or a high yield. Examples of perceived or actual difficulties that can reach up and, and affect uh, that valuation. Reduced access to credit markets. Certainly you saw this in, in 2008 and the early part of 2009 where credit markets just closed down so companies that were facing near-term refinancing risks just uh, their, their fixed income uh, obligations just got pummeled in, in, in price. 
Um, poor short-term operating performance, um, obviously some sort of unexpected loss, uh, um, you know, hurts your interest coverages and that can affect the valuation um, of a company's bonds or, or, or a dividend-based uh, obligation such that it, it creates a high yield opportunity. Deterioration in the value of assets or some sort of unexpected increase in liabilities, that often happens because of environmental or legal settlements, uh, things of that sort. Um, famous case many years ago where Texaco was sued by Pennzoil for, uh, for $10 billion. Their bonds got, got pummeled and uh, it turned out to be a very attractive play. Um, Buffett uh, um, purchased uh, those bonds on behalf of Berkshire Hathaway, did very well. Um, distressed positions. So these are securities that have already defaulted on their obligation, but they're trading at 20 cents on 10 cents, 20 cents on the dollar, 30 cents on the dollar. The primary concern here is valuing the cash and securities that you're likely to receive upon reorganization, whether that's through formal bankruptcy reorganization or informal reorganization. And a key consideration in whether you're going to participate in distressed positions is determining your seniority in the capital position. So that's kind of the technical. Let me run you through an example of a high yield investment. Uh, International Coal Group, the 10 and a quarter percent senior notes due July 15th 2014. Um, we purchased a little over a million dollars. Um, that's purchase, uh, sorry, that's face amount, excuse me. Um, purchase date November 2nd, 2009. We paid $96 uh, uh, per hundred dollar bond, so a slight discount to face. Um, I should say that in some ways we're not uh, demonstrating our brilliance here in March, those bonds were uh, selling under 70, like 65, 70. So on a 10 and a quarter percent coupon, if they continue to meet their obligations, you were setting up uh, um, high teens, low 20s yields to maturity. In our case, the yield to maturity is 11.6 percent. Still, we think very good, particularly in the context of a uh, two and three and four percent uh, government uh, bond environment. So some of the key terms, the notes rank equally with all other senior unsecured debt. Um, the company has an option to redeem at a hundred percent of value uh, beginning this July and through to July of 2012. There's a change of control provision in these bonds that uh, um, if there's a, a change of control, there's an immediate trigger to, to take out the bonds at 100% of face. Those are all fairly standard terms uh, and, and conditions. So let's talk about some of the things that led us to a decision to purchase these bonds. So let's deal with the capital structure. And just because we've now passed year end, I've worked this through uh, to, to 12 31 2009 just to give you a perspective. So there's 92.6 million in cash um, and equivalents on International Coal's balance sheet at December 31. There's 57.3 million in secured debt ahead of us. Um, that's primarily equipment notes. Um, obviously, coal mining company, they have huge. Uh, purchase or huge purchases of huge uh, earth moving equipment uh, caterpillar those sorts of things so there's uh, equipment notes that are secured um, and then there's two issues of unsecured debt the nine percent convertible notes that have 152 million uh, face value outstanding and then the ten and a quarter senior notes that we purchased uh, there's 175 million uh, outstanding as of the end of the year so if you take the cash um, or, or add up the secured debt and, and the, the convertible notes and, and the senior notes and subtract the cash, you get net debt of just under 300 million against shareholder equity of 609 million at the end of the year. So net debt to total capital, 0.32 to one. Um, we don't think that's uh, um, excessive leverage and so we think the coupon that we're getting paid relative to the capital structure looks attractive. So let's talk a little bit about uh, financial summary. Um, it's 53 million 
in interest expense, uh, or was 53 million, I'm going to come back to that, was 53 million for 2009 um, based on their uh, EBITDA, in this case a rough approximation of, of um, cash flow available to pay interest, um, was 201.7 million in 2009, a record for the company. So they have interest coverage of 3.8 times uh, based on their 2009 results. And they have capital expenditures uh, on a gap basis of about 66.4 million, uh, or did have in 2009, and have no reason to believe that that will vary uh, significantly going forward. And that's for maintenance capex. Um, so what are the considerations that, that led us to this decision? Uh, over 88% of their 2010 production is committed and priced. Um, they have a selling price averaging around $61 per ton versus a just under $50 cost per ton in 2009. Again, um, so the $61 per ton is the committed price for 2010. The cost per ton in, in 2009 was $49.44. Have no reason to believe that that will be significantly different uh, in 2010. Um, I talked about the $53 million in interest expense in 2009. Um, towards the end of 2009 in December, the company um, converted um, or, or had some of their, share, uh, their, their note holders of the convertible notes convert um, some of those notes and then there was a further conversion in January this year. So based on that, interest expense will be reduced by $10 million. Um, in 2010, so that interest coverage is getting better, not worse, if, if the top line and, and the operating results are, are similar. Um, International Coal Group uh, has a non-unionized workforce and low employee legacy costs, so we think that gives them some flexibility in terms of meeting their interest obligations. And as we talked earlier, there's a favorable capital structure position here. We have senior unsecured notes, the only thing ahead of us is the 50, 57 odd million in secured debt, mostly equipment notes. And I just note Wilbur Ross Group and Fairfax Financial are the largest shareholders. These are two um, very astute um, investing organizations and the fact that they own the common gives us some comfort. Um, certainly they're not, they wouldn't be obligated to, but we think that in the event that, that International Coal came up a little bit short, in terms of having enough cash to meet its interest obligations that likely um, one or both of those shareholders might step up through some sort of share issuance to, to put enough cash into the company to, to, to um, allow, allow it to, to continue to meet its interest obligations. Uh, collectively, they own somewhere over 40%. I'm not sure with the recent conversion, but it was about 42% um, based on the end of 09 uh, number. So we would like to think that we've made a good investment here that's going to give us an 11.6% uh, yield to maturity in 2014. Um, we think that if spreads tighten between governments and corporates that you know this could very well trade above par and, and it currently is at uh, about 101 right at the moment, but uh, maybe we'll get an opportunity to uh, clip the 10 and a quarter percent coupons and get a capital gain over and above par on this thing as we move forward. So we'll see. So that's an example of a dis uh, high yield and distressed uh, position. Let me just talk very quickly and then I'll wrap it up uh, on fixed income instruments. This is really a default position for us. It's just a parking spot um, for excess cash. When we have more cash than good ideas, it's just a parking spot until better opportunities emerge. And we're really trying to minimize our credit risk, minimize our interest rate risk. We're not doing anything fancy here and, and trying to, to make a lot of money uh, with our fixed income instruments. We're just trying to protect our capital. So example, uh, Government of Canada Treasury Bill, 0.06% uh, due March 18th, 2010. Um, very simple. I don't think I need to say anything more about that. So um, hope that gives you a flavor 
uh, for the types of investments that we make and our investment philosophy in action. Um, I just thank you for the time and uh, I'll, I'll open it up to questions. And I've got Bill here. Bill's the heavy artillery. If you guys shred me too hard here, I'm going to call him up and uh, um, he, he can take over uh, when I'm beaten. Uh, so please, anybody, uh, anybody have any questions? Yes? Question about Indigo. Um, how large do you think the risk is of the Canadian Competition Bureau coming in and opening it up to foreign competition? Uh, and allowing some of the competitors from the states to come up and compete with choppers in the going Canada? Um, always a risk. D don't know how to handicap that. Of course, one option might be that a U.S. or, or other uh, global uh, competitor may make an offer to purchase Indigo. So it's not clear to me that if that happened, that that's necessarily uh, a negative. Um, but I, I should tell you that you know Indigo's best in class right now. If, if you benchmark them against Barnes & Noble or, or Borders down in the United States in terms of you know, margins, um, operating <coughs> margins, uh, returns on capital, I mean, they are clearly uh, performing um, marvelously relative to their competitors. So, so again, I'm maybe, uh, um, maybe Barnes & Noble would think twice about coming up to Canada even if, if the government would, uh, would open it up. But, you know, obviously a risk. Can't, can't handicap it for you, um, but something we think about and uh, um, you're, you're correct to, to raise it as an issue. Oh, yes, sorry, you first and then, uh, yeah. Um, for international coal, is there any particular reason why you decided to buy the uh, senior note rather than the convertible note? Um, we just thought, it, first of all, it's a better yield. Um, and at the time, uh, the converts were basically at par. So um, we just thought it was a better overall uh, purchase that would give us a higher rate of return, all things uh, considered. Yes. Yeah, um, I have a two question. One mm -hmm. question is related with the uh, what kind of industries um, Jeff and, uh, and you and Bill are expert in? Uh, what kind of industry are investing for the uh, investment holdings? And the other question is related about the economic crisis that we had um, in 2008. How how did you decide not to follow the market in respect of what the market was doing and how faithful you were? Um, first question, um, you might want to ask our unit holders, they might say we have no particular expertise or competence in any industry group, I'm not sure. Um, typically, and, and, and you see it in our investment results that I put up, um, over the time that we've operated, the Canadian market's been the better performer of the two. You know, over longer periods of time, uh, you know, I'm talking 30, 40, 50 years, the U.S. market has actually outperformed the Canadian market. But part of the drivers of the Canadian market outperformance relative to the U.S. market over the period of time that we've operated has been this commodity boom. And I think it's safe to say we don't consider ourselves um, for the most part, we don't find uh, base metals, gold, oil to be within our circle of competence. We keep trying and we hope to expand our circle of competence over time, but um, we just find it too hard to make predictions about what the price of oil is going to be. You know, oil companies are actually quite simple to model cash flow if you knew precisely what the price of oil is going to do and what price they can sell their oil for. Of course, we find that very difficult to do and so we, we were underrepresented all the way through this uh, commodity cycle. So I'll maybe answer the question in, in a backhanded fashion. Those commodity oriented businesses, uh, we tend not to feel that we, we, we have expertise in. Um, with respect to the, the credit crisis and the, 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 the market downturn in, in uh, uh, 2008, um, I think the biggest thing that uh, we tried to do was just stick to our knitting. And 
So, you know, let the record show, yes, we were, we were down in 2008. We did not, it was only our second losing year in our history uh, relative to, to five losing years for, for the overall market. So, yes, we took our lumps in 2008. Um, we were down not as much as the overall markets, which is something that we would have expected. And I think, again, that notion of eat well, sleep well. I think we just have this built-in... Um, we try to manage risk by understanding our companies and understanding what's going to drive their results over long periods of time. And then if we can buy those at attractive prices, we tend to, to ride out the storm. And uh, George and Bill and I were to went out for dinner before, uh, uh, before this. And maybe I can illustrate this through, through a story that we were talking about at dinner. Um, imagine, if you will that you were around in 1919 when Coca-Cola went public. The initial, uh, the IPO price for Coca-Cola was $40 a share. Um, admittedly, in real terms, that was uh, not um, an insignificant sum in 1919 for most people. But So let's say you're able to buy one share in 1919. And let's imagine that you didn't really have an insight in terms of how the company itself was going to unfold, but you had perfect knowledge about all the macroeconomic events that were going to transpire over the next 90 years up to the end of 2009. And, and let's just recap. You know, you had the, the 1929 stock market crash and global depression. You had a world war. You had uh, a presidential uh, assassination, a presidential impeachment. You had nuclear. You had uh, uh, nuclear threats. You had, uh, um, you know, numerous skirmishes around the world. You had interest rates at one percent. You had interest rates at twenty-one percent. Um, probably you wouldn't have bought Coca-Cola if you just focused on the big picture events. But the reality is Coca-Cola went from being a uh, small U.S. domestic um, soft drink provider to this large global entity over the next 90 years. And that $40 that you invested in Coca-Cola in 1919, including reinvested dividends at the end of 2009 had grown to seven, just under $7.2 million, representing a 14.8% compound over the 90 years. So I hope that kind of illustrates and gets at the question you're asking. Um, it's not that the macro uh, economic issues are not important, they are. But it's, it's, it's just that most of them are unknowable. And so if we can by a company that we can really dig into and understand it, we'll let that compounding happen over time. So I hope that answers uh, the question. Yes? Um, how do you justify to your investors the deployment of multiple strategies within a single fund? Um, if they really wanted like merger arbitrage, distressed debt, and value investing, why wouldn't they just buy a pure play value investing fund and then buy into a merger arbitrage hedge fund as well? Especially given that hedge funds that do merger arbitrage typically utilize a lot of leverage and might be able to get additional returns that uh, you wouldn't be able to do. I actually think it's an advantage um, the way we are structured. And, and the way I liken it is we have more than one page in our playbook. And so that, um, you know, if there's periods in time where there's not uh, good equity investments to be made. You know, if you're in an equity fund where investors pressure the manager to be 100% invested in equities at all times, well, you're going to end up, you know, playing a relative game where you're going to put equities into your portfolio that, although perhaps relatively priced attractively, are not absolutely priced attractively. So we take a different approach. We just say um, that. We have, we think we're qualified and competent in those areas, and we uh, sift through the ideas that come forward and try and make the best judgments that will get us the highest overall rate of return, and we think that's a, an attractive proposition. Vis-a-vis um, -vis the leverage aspect with, with hedge funds, um, 
we do not uh, tend to leverage, only in a, a very modest way and usually when we know that uh, we're going to be off leverage within a uh, um, two or three month period because we'll have new capital coming into the, to, to the funds. Um, again, I, I mean, obviously our unit holders are free to, to leave us at any point in time or not give us their capital and pursue four strategies or three strategies independently, but we just think the combination of all three together um, actually gives us an advantage because it gives us several pages in our investment playbook, and so it just sharpens our discipline. So um, that's the answer to that. Um, yes? In terms of your cash flow, um, what's the most cash in terms of the percentage you have on hand at one time or the least, the range? Hmm. Good question, and, and I'm going from memory here. Um, other than the very early days when we started the fund and you know there's a lag period as you as you get the capital invested I would say probably somewhere around 35 percent in cash would be the the high and right down to to zero or actually negative uh, for those brief periods where where we had some modest leverage but again I want to emphasize we're not um, leveraged as a matter of course so let's call it you know 35 percent at the high give or take uh, right down to uh, to zero. And to follow up on that, like Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, they they get their cash flow through a lot of insurance companies. That's where they get most of their free yeah. cash flow. How do you guys get that through unit holders, or do, how do you raise capital? Well, hopefully, uh, you know, we have new unit holders contributing capital uh, um, on a regular basis, and I think other than one year. Um, we have had net capital inflows to, to our funds uh, o over their inception, and we just hope to, to grow it. But you know, we also don't want to get a lot of capital in at once because that can reduce returns. So we've been very conscious about trying to grow through word of mouth, and you know, the best way to get a new client is to have an, a happy existing client who tells someone. Uh, who hopefully is just like them, and uh, so so we've been pretty conscious about not trying to be um, a marketing machine and getting new capital in. It's just a different model than Berkshire. I mean, Berkshire obviously is an operating company. We're not an operating company, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, last count, I believe Berkshire's got close to two hundred million dollars a week coming in in free cash flow after. Uh, after all the needs of the operating subsidiaries are met. Um, yes? What's the difference between, uh, different mandate between the two funds that you have, the limited partner and the RSP? Uh, for example, if you find a new like, undervalued company that you would like to invest in, which portfolio would you put it in and what criteria we use? Uh, they, they tend to go into both portfolios on a uh, kind of a equal weighting basis. Um, right now our LP is larger than our RSP funds, so there's less going into the RSP um, numerically, but the same uh, percentage-wise. Um, there are some minor differences, more uh, owing to regulatory constraints in the RSP fund than the LP, but... Uh, Basically, the two funds mirror each other, but we've tried to keep the taxable capital, if you will, in the LP and the untaxable capital, pension, RSP, RIF capital, um, in the RSP fund. And we, again, we think that actually creates an advantage. There might be a scenario where you could argue that we might ring the cash register in the RSP fund um, a little more frequently just because the transactions on taxable now I, I should tell you it, it really hasn't worked out that way and the two tend to mirror each other uh, um, over time and of course there are a few legacy um, issues um, or legacy securities if you will in, in the LP that are not in the RSP fund but that was just because the RSP fund started in 2004 we owned them before that in the LP um, we still like them, but you know, for whatever reason, we weren't able to accumulate a holding in the RSP fund. But absent those kind of differences, they tend to, to mirror each other. Yes, anybody? Um, here, we'll. Okay. So you showed a return of about 19% annualized for some, one of your strategies there. And I was just wondering if you adjust these for risk when you're comparing them to other invest investments you could potentially invest in. So do you use sort of a sharp ratio concept or? Is there any way you adjust it? Because some of those are riskier strategies than, say, throwing it in a bond. So 
So I was just wondering how you adjust for that. Uh, fair question. We tend not to be believers in in uh, sharp ratios or some of those uh, risk management tools. Again, when when we look at these things, we're just trying to take a, as much risk out of it as possible. And believe it or not, um, now we'll see in the case of IMS Health, maybe it's not going to happen. But in that transaction, the offset is that we're trying to buy into arbitrage and workout situations that have a very high probability of happening. So 96, 97 times out of 100. Um, so yeah, on any individual arbitrage deal, you might take a toe stubbing because something happens and the deal doesn't go through and then you know the share price plummets. But we take a very actuarial approach to it and say over 100 of these things will still generate a, a very good rate of return. So I know I'm in a way dodging the question, but we just don't view the world that way. We look at each one individually and try to take as much risk out of it as we can in terms of uh, making the purchase decision. Yes? If you don't, uh, you see, if you don't believe in cap out measures like sharp ratio, information ratio, uh, how do you uh, uh, use a standard uh, measurement for you versus other managed products to convince uh, the potential clients to with you guys? We like we let the clients decide. Um, we think that if, you know, I, I have theories or my own personal theory that one way to judge a money manager is how he does in down markets. Um, you know, when markets are flying high and, and markets are going up, um, it's pretty easy to put up good performance. I think, you know, the real test of a money manager is how they do in down markets. And so if you look at our history, um, not with any sort of analytical sharp ratio precision, but we've only had two down years versus five down years for the market. Um, and, and so that's the measures that we tend to use. And if you look at the points in time where both, uh, where the US market had a negative return or the Canadian market had a negative return, in those years, on average, we actually posted a positive rate of return. Not by much, but, um, a slight positive rate of return. So that's how we tend to think about risk. And I know that's not um, perhaps what, what, what university uh, textbooks teach, um, but, but we just think that's real world risk. And so uh, I couldn't even calculate a sharp ratio for you without a lot of help right now. So, um, what was the worst year, the worst year you had? Uh, 2008, we were down 22% uh, in the LP, 20% in the RSP fund. Um, off the top of my head, I think that compared to down 33% um, for the Toronto Stock Exchange down 37% for the S&P 500 nominally or 20, 23% in Canadian dollars. So I'll perform both those benchmarks, Al although we were negative and uh, I would be lying if I said we covered ourselves in glory in 2008. Clearly we did not. For me, uh, this is better than the sharp ratio. I mean, you say I, I, lost, I lost mine in two years and my worst year was 20%. And you look at the, the market and the Worse, more, more losses and bigger losses. Right, right. It's, it's just the downside less than there's upside potential. Right. And sometimes uh, investment counselors use a balance of the two. Yeah. We, but, uh, look, I, I mean, I guess to answer your question, or to, to put it, you know, we do not market any of those measures to our clients. Um, if they, um, if they're choosing to use those measures, I would suggest perhaps we're not the right fit for them. Because we are really taking a long, long-term business-like approach to this where um, if we get the business right, we think over time our absolute rate of return will be acceptable and that's what it's all about. And uh, But again, you know, that eat well, sleep well notion, uh, we've tended to define our risks pretty carefully uh, by looking at the companies, not the overall portfolio and really understanding our companies and what can go wrong. So I think we get to the same space at the end. We're maybe just attacking it from a different uh, perspective. Yes? Um. You've been in business for a considerable amount of time at this point, and through the 90s you saw the accessibility of investments to the average person increase. Um, at a time now where everybody and their grandma claims they were a value investor, do you find that finding those investment ideas has become harder 
direction when you first started and how do you see that trending in the future? On balance, no. I mean, I think there are periods in time where it gets harder and then it gets easier. I mean, clearly last March, and you know, we were buying all through the fall of 2008 and into early 2009, and so we were early um, with perfect hindsight, uh, um, as it always is, we would have been better served to wait, but clearly March of 2009, I mean, there were many attractively priced securities that value investors uh, could understand, could meet all the framework that, that, that we laid out earlier to you, and uh, so we were, were active buyers all through that piece. So even though there's been this ubiquity of, of internet information and CNBC and Bloomberg, what doesn't change is the emotion that can grip markets from time to time. And so, you know, that Ben Graham principle is just so important um, to, to uh, not let the market uh, um, guide you or, you know, just use it to your advantage. Uh, obviously, that was like a liquidity issue and uh, an extenuating circumstance, but outside of that, you still see that there's still just as much ease in finding some good ideas as you, there was in 95? Yeah, I, I think the one thing that's changed, and, and um, although this isn't the reason we moved from uh, hardcore Ben Graham net net working capital to more the better business style, but I do think it's harder to apply the traditional Ben Graham, very formula driven net net working capital approach because you have computers today that just tend to, to very quickly bargain that away for the investor. So I do think that's a little bit harder to do now, but um, identifying a good business is as much about the qualitative. You know, the phrase I like to use is, you know, the, the quantitative part is all about looking out the rear view mirror and, you know, has this been a great business uh, uh, quantitatively demonstrated? But where the money's made is by swiveling around and looking out the front windshield of the car and saying, is there anything that we can point to that would suggest the future's going to be radically different than the past? And, and that's where the money's made. Um, of course, you know, those things are hard to predict and, and we've made mistakes from time to time. Uh, um, what Bill and I jokingly call the, wow, never saw that coming moment. And uh, you know, those things do happen. Um, but but uh, no, I, I mean, I think there's just periods of time where it gets easier, periods of time where it gets harder, but on balance, no. Yes? Um, you're a student of Ben Graham and Warren Buffett in terms of the <coughs> philosophies. Are there any other people you might listen to or um, follow up on? In terms oh, of uh, yeah. Um, you know, some of my heroes, uh, Sir John Templeton, um, <coughs> Fabulous. Um, you know, certainly, many of the uh, uh, speakers that have come through the Value Center the last five years. Um, you know, Mason Hawkins, Peter Kundal's been a terrific investor uh, um, for a, a, a long, long period of time. Uh, I run the risk now. I'm not going to mention somebody, and I'm going to get into trouble. But uh, you know, Francis Chu, or uh, um, you know, so lots of heroes. Um, Peter Lynch. I, I mean, is is a um, I think been an excellent investor for a long, long period of time. Really recommend uh, his books to you. So, so lots, lots. Do you listen to anybody right now in terms of, I know you don't listen to macro events, but the big picture going on in the U.S. and the debt? I mean, obviously you can't discount it entirely and you, you try to think about it. I think the key is just not letting that cloud your view if you find a really great business. Um, particularly one that's global, uh, that, that sells in many different markets around the world. Um, I just try, I think it's really important not to let those big picture uh, considerations cloud your judgment. But sure, you think about it. Um, you know, when I get together with other money managers, it's a regular common uh, um, topic of discussion. And, uh, you know, in addition to, you know, 
what do you like and why do you like it that, that, that we all quiz each other on, um, you know, what, what's happening in markets. Um, so yeah, you think about it, but I just think it's really, really important to, to, to try and identify those superstar businesses uh, and, and buy them when uh, all the factors are in place that will make them be above average return on uh, investment propositions for you. What is your exit strategy? Uh, sorry, your exit strategy. Uh, so again, I, I've, yeah, on, 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 our, on our long-term investment holdings, I think there's four reasons for selling uh, that that could uh, that you you could put into to practice. The first is is just the obvious, you know, that the shares have increased dramatically above intrinsic value. Um, so defined, and so you're a seller for that reason. Um, we will sell when we feel we've been deceived by management either in our conversations with them or through the financial statements. Um, you know, we'll be a seller. Um, the other one that, that happens quite a bit is, is where you still like something but you're capital constrained and you found something that you like even better that's cheaper so you have to take some money off the table. So a variety of, 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 of reasons uh, for selling, those would be the main ones. Yes? How would you generally communicate with the management of a company that you're currently invested in? Certainly initially you want to, to see them and understand where they're coming from. After that, I'm not necessarily a big believer that you've got to be knocking on their door every uh, 90 days or six months. Businesses don't change that frequently. Um, so so I, I, I answer your question kind of two ways and divide it into two sections. There's the initial um, information gathering and getting comfortable with that company as an investment. And then past that, um, candidly, you can monitor it through the public record. Um, um, certainly most large companies now, even many small ones, have quarterly conference calls. You can read transcripts, you can listen to all those things, but um, you know, we're just trying to monitor and say as things change. You know, I, in some respects the whole quarterly conference call chase has really done investors a disservice in my mind because you know, one quarter doesn't really matter. If you've got the 10-year focus right, you'll be just fine. And so what if one quarter they didn't meet the expectations of analysts or, or, or they had a bad quarter for reasons that are explainable, um, you know, and they're, they're fixing the problems? Uh, that's, that's fine with us. So um, just continue to follow the public documents. Um, actually, one of the questions that... that uh, George posited to me as I was preparing for this, and, and I didn't really cover in the presentation, how do we get information? Read public documents, annual reports, 10Ks, 10Qs. Um, I'm not like Buffett. Uh, Bill and I have occasionally read a research report from a broker, um, but you know we do think that getting it um, from the public source documents is really the appropriate place to to really get an understanding of a company and and also its competitors. So, um, you know, when we have a, an investment in Indigo, you know, we're reading about Barnes and Noble and Amazon and Borders and and the other com competitors uh, to them to try and understand what what's affecting their business and what Indigo what may be a risk to Indigo uh, um, later on. So. Public source documents, definitely, that's where we get most of our information. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, two more questions and then we're okay. finished. Um, what, is, I'll ask them. <laughs> um, what is the biggest mistake a novice investor <coughs> makes? I th uh, well, I'll, I'll share a mistake that we made and then I'll talk I in a general uh, way. Uh, biggest mistake that, and, and I wish I could blame it on Bill. This was actually before Bill joined the company, so I, gotta, I have to go solo on this one. We had an investment in a company called Oppenheimer Industries that turned out uh, going bankrupt, and we just got the management wrong. Um, 
Um, this is public record. Uh, they turned out to have criminal charges filed against them uh, and ended up in, in jail. Oppenheimer Industries was this company that had the largest uh, single piece of freestanding land in the United States of America. I think it was like 387 thousand acres or something like that, the Armendaris Ranch in New Mexico, and of course it had all these wild and wonderful, it had water rights, it had mineral, it had cattle grazing, it was going to be developed into uh, um, prime residential vacation property, all these wild things that, that were going to surface enormous value, and of course none of it happened. And then we compounded the error by once the company went into receivership, uh, the three largest shareholders, which were the Kundal Funds and Harvard University and us, um, we formed a committee to try and see if we could purchase some of the debt in, in, dis in a distressed form and um, ended up spending, quite frankly, too much money trying to, to chase a dead horse. So we made, we made two mistakes on that one. The first one, investing in it because it really wasn't a great business. And secondly, uh, um, putting more capital in to try and prove up something after uh, we should have just cut our losses and run. Um, I think the biggest mistake that, that most investors make is just not properly controlling their emotions and, and being too short term in nature. Um, it's hard. Everybody says they want to be a long term investor, but it's hard to do. Um, you have all this noise out there and people telling you when a share price goes down that you're, you're wrong and you're an idiot. Um, you know, I'll, I'll even use Berkshire Hathaway as an example of that. Um, again, similar to the Coke story I told earlier, you know, oh, uh, investing in Berkshire Hathaway, it was easy, right? You were around in 1964 when the shares were, you know, 10 or $12. You saw that Buffett was a genius. You put your money down. You sit back 30 years later, you take your rightful place on the Forbes 400 list. Well, it's not that simple. Um, on several occasions, Berkshire Hathaway shares dropped 40%. Um, year over year and uh, on a couple occasions north of 50%. And um, so it's, it's hard to be a long-term investor. And on one of those 50% occasions, we were, were owners uh, of, of Berkshire uh, around the turn of the century uh, when technology shares were flying. Berkshire went from roughly 82,000 down to 41,000. Uh, everybody was calling Warren yesterday's man. Um, you know, at 82,000, we didn't think the shares were, uh, we thought they were probably fairly valued, but we didn't think they were excessively valued or we would have been sellers. But at 41,000, um, you were buying Berkshire Hathaway at less than the value of the securities portfolio, less all debt at that point in time, and you were getting the wholly owned businesses for less than nothing. But everybody was saying, you know, that Buffett was yesterday's man and he didn't understand the new world. And, uh, you know, it's hard when, those, when that noise uh, comes at you not to be influenced by that. So I think that's the biggest mistake that investors make. Okay, the last one is, uh, what is the biggest lesson you learned over your last 20 years in investing and in life? I always ask uh, this question, and the most difficult question is at the end. Well, one of the things that, that I love so much about going to the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting is, yes, you learn lessons about investing, but you learn lessons about life. And you have to be honest. And... If you're going to try and get there in a hurry by cutting corners, it will ultimately catch up with you. And uh, Warren and Charlie have uh, certainly weighed in many times over the years in many different forms with wonderful lessons about honesty and integrity. And if you don't have that, you have nothing in life. And you have to be able to look yourself in the mirror. So that would be the biggest lesson that I've learned in 25 years of doing this. So thank you.